while the, the folks at SMT are getting, getting set up. Um, reminder of the, the mock expansion draft that we're doing as part of the conference. So um, for those of you who registered in advance, you should have an email with some instructions. So if you could try to get that done, uh, maybe by the end of lunch, you uh, should be able to do that on your phone. Um, and, and get those in, and uh, we're saving with uh, OTT HAC as our prefix. Uh, also, we've got a raffle that we'll do uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we've got a signed senator's jersey, as well as some uh, some nice uh, gear donated by the St. Lawrence women's hockey team uh, that we'll raffle off there. Um, so we are very fortunate uh, this year to have SMT as, uh, as one of our sponsors. Um, and really because they're just doing such such cool stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited. Um, Jim Doden is the general manager and vice president there. Uh, and Jim's got uh, MBA and undergraduate degrees from Georgia Tech. And I'm going to let Jim uh, introduce his team. Sure. Thank you, Michael and uh, Shirley and the university for putting us on and for letting us be up here. We're really thrilled to be here. And, uh, Hopefully you guys are excited to see what we've got as well. We're excited to share it. Um, we've got a lot of respect for the folks in this audience. Um, many of you are in current positions of influence with teams or as writers in, in the space. Some of you are the next generation, and I assume all of us in here are hockey fans. Um, so in one of those categories, we can all relate to the stuff you're about to see. Um, as we read a lot of the stuff you guys write, and I've put some of our favorite Bowman books up here that, uh, that we've taken, we, we look at that stuff and we look at it through the lens of you know, how can technology help solve some of the, uh, the ending points of, of the state of the art that it is today. Um, so we're going to share with you a number of those. We're our aim is to get you excited about this. We want you to say, man, i got to have that stuff and uh, help us get this deal done. So. Um, what you're going to see today are what we call six, uh, you know, shot quality and danger attributes. So these are all automated. These are things that just can happen uh, immediately. Graham and Tanner are with me. They're going to walk through each of those. What becomes really interesting is then we take those, and probably all of you are going to look at each one and say, "Man, I just did it this way, this way, this way." We don't have time. We're going to look at three different positions. We're going to look at you know, shooters from the aspect of sniper skill and get some really interesting things there. Um, we're also going to look at an area of defensemen where we think we might be able to change and, and make them a little bit more appreciated. Um, and then finally, this theme of measuring goalies has come up quite a bit, and we're going to share a few things about that as well. Um, so I'm Jim Doden, as, as Michael said. I uh, have the privilege of working on this product from a business standpoint. Um, I'm a hockey fan. I grew up playing hockey uh, from the cornfields of Ohio, so I didn't have a great uh, opportunity to play competitively as a kid. But as Michael said, I went to Georgia Tech and played club hockey there, which you might say, gosh, why should I trust, trust a guy from Georgia uh, about hockey? Um, but I can say that uh, with a straight face, I've skated in several hundred NHL games. Don't let me do it okay, for a minute. Um, so uh, while I was in Atlanta, I was one of five people that could skate, and the Thrashers came calling and said, could you be on our Zamboni crew? Which I thought was the coolest thing in the world as a, as a kid. Um, so I was out there skating during TV timeouts when you guys didn't, uh, didn't see me. Um, at any rate, uh, a few years later, I founded a uh, player tracking company that used off-the-shelf RFID tracking. We had that working with the Thrashers for a number of years. Um, Ultimately, the NHL wasn't as excited about that as I was, first time I just met it. Um, so we folded that company. Um, I learned a lot about the limitations of that technology. Um, and then many years later, Sport Vision had an opportunity and I joined and I'm really thrilled to be working with this uh, infrared technology. Um, you know, so we've, we've got a number of things to share with you today. Some of you in the audience are uh, come at hockey from a baseball point of view. There are people that study sabermetrics and say, how can we do some more things in hockey? Um, so a couple guys I have with us today are uh, Graham Goldbeck, who's got a started his career working for Major League Baseball teams in analytics. 
Um, he has worked on all of our uh, premier products at SMT on their baseball products. Some audience members asked some questions about some products that we have. Um, so he has a unique lens. I think you'll, you'll learn a lot from his perspective as he talks. Uh, Tanner Guzik is uh, relatively new to our team. He cut his teeth for the world, at the World Cup of Hockey, so he was a guy behind the scenes, taking all the data, trying to make a story out of it. Um, and he probably knows more than anybody about this data set, so he's a good guy to learn from. So a little bit about SMT real quickly. If you watch football, especially if it's in the United States, where the guys put in the yellow line, uh, and now the blue line, on the field, pretty much can't consume a football broadcast without seeing our product. Uh, we also do a range of things in terms of what we call augmented reality, just putting things on the broadcast that aren't actually there. Um, so this is one of those things. We also do the official scoring systems for many leagues. Um, you can see some of them here. Some of you might notice one of those. Um, and real quickly, we just want to kind of review what we did at the World Cup. Everything you're going to see is based on that data set. Uh, the primary thing we did there were broadcast effects. So I'll go ahead and play a video just to remind us. If you love speed, this is the team you should cheer for because you want them to play more. Team North America, they're fantastic. They're young. They're abrasive. They're not respecting their opponents. And they are fast. Watch right there. The speed jump by the defense when you attack the net. Now, they're not just a perimeter team that scores from the side. They're gritty. they got character. Character. They're tough. Right here, you're going to see just steal the puck. Use their speed for defense also. And turn that speed from defense into offense and get a great scoring jam. They attack the net very, very well. Shots from the point. You catch people from behind. Right here, we're pointing to the guy in front of the net. Just winning loose puck battle because they're so fast. So, I love the fact that their offensive uh, speed is used for offense and also defense. It's like working in a Lamborghini shop here, Lee. So interested to see what play they're going to run. They have one one-timer option up high over on the far side. Thomas Tatar, the Detroit Red Wings, right? So we'll see if Kovatar can get it. Here comes Tatar. Oh, All right, let's get in. He's got to get a shot at this bar. Bambi's on the front unit. Take a look at this. 35 to 40 feet distance from that pass. Great job using <laughs> That's Jakub Borchek and the Philadelphia Flyers. He's going down his offside, the left hand shot going down the right side of the ring. Now watch his stick. See that flex, but do you see the little delay? Yeah, the circle chain. Yes, the little delay. He doesn't follow through all in one motion. So what's interesting about it, all that is all that happens with our system within 200 milliseconds. So whether you see it on the first replay or over intermission, all that stuff is happening basically in real time as we find. It has to be done that way in order to make it to the TV broadcast. But as a, as a byproduct of all that, we're storing all this player and puck tracking data. And just to characterize the data set real quick, we've got roughly 10.3 million data points. And that's not in and of itself that interesting. I mean, you can have more data, Miss Piggy says more is better. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean more is better. In our case, it's not only in the XY space, but in the Z space. Um, if you're looking for something with statistical volume out of this event, was shots. So a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today are based on shots. And a couple other things as we start to, to look at this and we walk you through what we've got. You know, keep in mind we've got the 200 best players. And on one hand, you've got a lot of elite skill. But on the other hand, you've got you know, fourth line, you know, first liners playing in fourth line positions. There's not a lot of variance between the top to bottom. Also, as we start to look at some of the defensive stuff for black shots, you know, Josh Georges, Chris Russell, they weren't playing in this tournament, so the guys you think of as, as being prototypical for those uh, analysis we don't have. Um, but the nice thing is, with all this data set, we can actually train all of our algorithms, and I think you'll see some of the outcomes are exactly what you might expect. Um, so last thing, and just to help you understand the technology. So at SMT, we, we have experience in you know, just about every sport. In baseball, we use passive computer, computer vision to track objects. In NASCAR, we put a military-grade GPS in the car and an IMU. We track 200 mile, mile an hour cars with two centimeters of accuracy. Um, in golf, we use lasers to track the ball. We use uh, computer vision as well. We put this IR system on motorcycles so that you can see them in 3D as they jump and supercross. 
So the technology, we're, we, our engineering team really studies the dynamic of the sport and studies the right, or applies the right traffic to it. Now what this graphic is trying to, to help everybody understand is really, you know, our system is one inch of accuracy, and as it relates to the puck and the player, think about where they are. Their ground truth is the center of that bullseye, right? So if you're trying to track that center of the bullseye with one inch of accuracy and you're comparing two players, at most you get two inches of variance. With a lot of the other technologies out there, you're more in the upper left category there. Um, and I can speak from the RFID standpoint for this. You're all over the map. You're not necessarily ever hitting that uh, bullseye exactly where the player the puck up is. And in those cases, you're up to two feet of, of error. So imagine that the interval between the center and the first ring is two feet. You're comparing two players. Now you've got up to four feet of error built into that. At the puck, you've got another two feet. Now you're talking about six feet. What you're going to see in this presentation, everything we're doing, we just don't think you can do it unless you've got one inch of accuracy. And we're going to try to show you that the dividing lines between a good player and an elite player are actually pretty, pretty precise. I'll turn it over to Graham, who's going to walk you through some of this. Thank you. So, uh, as Jim mentioned, I come from primarily a baseball background, so probably a lot of the analogies I'll turn over the next couple slides will be baseball related. So this first graphic, um, this is just shot placement of, of all shots in the tournament. It's important to note that this is not only shots on goal, but missed shots, blocked shots, um, and this is all projected shot location. So, you know, even if a shot was blocked 30 feet away from the goal, we still know where it would be going. Um, so it looks like you know it's these amount of shots on this chart, and I, I did cut off shots at uh, about a ten foot by eight foot uh, range here. So while it looks like there's a lot of shots uh, on goal, remember that you know despite it being the whole tournament, that is still only about one and a half nights worth of, of hockey, like in the NHL season. Um, so one of the good things about this chart is uh, to draw the baseball analogy. Our Kazo product, we plot the you know, pitch location of the pitch when it crosses the front of home plate. So that tells you a lot about the pitcher, it tells you where he's trying to throw the ball, if he needs his spot accurately. But we also think it tells you a lot about all the other players. It tells you about the batter, his ability to hit the ball in certain locations. It tells you about the catcher, his ability to frame the pitch uh, very well and get additional call ball and strikes. And even the umpire as well. Um, similar for hockey, while we think you know, shooting is primarily the shooter skill and his ability to place his shots, uh, think about also the goalie in this chart, and uh, sorry, the goals are blue. So uh, you can do this like a goalie chart and see uh, the goalies have certain weaknesses in certain areas, and even defensemen as well. Uh, just the guy defending on a shot, does he defend his player in a certain way such that he forces his opponent to shoot in areas that are more desirable for his goalie to make a save? Um, so some interesting things to note um, from this heat map here, you can see that uh, Almost the majority of shots, the red of the heat map, uh, is centered probably low glove side, uh, since I believe all goalies in this tournament were right handed. Um, and then almost two thirds, or almost half of all shots, end up in the lower third of the goal. Um, but you can see it, it kind of frames pretty well where guys are shooting. It's, it's most of them. Uh, sorry, uh, quick question, quick poll. Uh, what do you think the average shot speed was for all shots in the tournament? Just a number. You shot it. I'm sorry, miles per hour. That's a, we're Americans, so bear with us. Uh, I heard a couple numbers. Uh, the answer is 47. Um, and so what we have with this chart here is we took all shots in the tournament. Um, by shot type and, and graph the various distributions. So these are density maps of, of each shot type. Um, it's good, you can tell tracking is pretty much working. It looks like what we expect. Backhands are the slowest shots. You have your deflective tip shots, and then uh, slap shots to the hardest. Um, certain things to know in this chart, you'll see that snapshots and wrist shots, the blue and purple lines, seem to mirror each other pretty closely. Uh, I think that's probably a little more unusual than you might think would happen. Uh, with this type of data set. Um, I think people would generally assume snapshots would be quicker than wrist shots just because the ability to uh, you know, pull the puck further back, pull the stick further back before it contacts the puck. Um, but speculating that since this data is collected live, uh, it's probably very difficult to differentiate the two. Um, so maybe with further study, it might 
we might be able to see that snapshots are faster than shots, or it's possible that they are uh, very similar in speed, and which would be interesting for study. Um, some of the things to note about just players and shot speeds, um, you know, all the good players regularly can get it up to 90 plus miles per hour. Um, someone like Sidney Crosby, who uh, he's, some people might not think is, uh, has the generate speeds like that, he was regularly at 90 this tournament. Um, and then also, uh, you'll notice in the green chart at the end, the, the shot speeds kind of still go for uh, slap shots a little bit over 100 miles per hour. The fastest shot we tracked this tournament was a Shea Weber slap shot at 107 miles an hour. And uh, if there's any doubt to the accuracy of tracking, don't take our word for it. Off the turnover now. Back to the point. Weber rockets a big juicy rebound. That was going on here. The Mokowski kick. <laughs> so, uh, Barry was a little, little slow, but. Uh, and then we made this graph here. So, the, uh, we think of the X. X, Y is the position on the ice, and then the contour part of the map, the E, is the closest defender, ranging from about 7 to 13 feet or so. Um, and I think it's a really interesting chart. So uh, you can see, obviously, the darkest blue is right in the middle from the goal, which is what we expect, you know, the, the home plate area. You can almost think of this as probably a, a way of imagining the shape of the home plate area. It doesn't quite look the home plate area. To draw another baseball analogy, um, we know that the strike zone, you know, is defined as this rectangle. But when you actually do like a contour map, you can see the strike zone has much more of a circular shape. It may be something similar here, where the home plate is actually you know, more of a, a, a circle or a oblong shape. Um, you can also see that uh, the right for the blue line, the kind of graph, you know, the further away you get from the blue line, the more open the shooter is, and that, that makes sense. You know, if uh, you take a slap shot from far away, you're more likely to be open. Right in front of the blue line, it can go from red back to orange, back to red real quick. And I'm guessing, uh, it could be a small sample issue, um, but also I'm guessing there's probably keying off the blue line maybe. Um, defenders can see the blue line, so they're able to close down those shots more. That could be something that's going on. Um, and I think it's really important so you can visualize this chart. We're talking only about shots just because uh, we like this for the tournament. There are a lot of them, and it's a very discrete variable. But you can imagine doing this type of chart, uh, like a movement openness chart, for just players for the entire game. Like uh, it's you know it's very important to get open in front of the net. Now, if you don't have the puck, or they couldn't get the puck to you, uh, as an offensive player, it's not necessarily your fault. If you were able to get open in the right spot, that's that hockey sensibility that uh, we're trying to model here, and I think it's something that we can definitely model. In, uh, hasn't really been done too much before. All right, thank you, Grant. So the next thing we're gonna talk about uh, that we looked at is uh, shot vertical angle. Um, so with the style of goaltending that's, that's played today, uh, scores near the net have unique um, geometrical challenges uh, to, to, to lift the puck over the goalie's pads and up, up into the top part of the net. Um, and the closer you get to the net, the more sharp the angle is uh, required to, to, to elevate the puck over the goalie and finally the, the open parts of the net. So we looked at the vertical angle of shots taken, just in, uh, only in some shots taken inside the two face-off circles. Um, and um, it appears that being able to, to, to lift the puck um, it increases shooting percentage up to one and a half to two times. Um, and, and we imagine combining um, these type of shot angles with uh, the shot placement chart that you saw earlier, a couple slides back that Graham was talking about, um, and, and uh, maybe with a, a season or two of data, that would be um, really illuminating stuff. Okay, uh, the next thing uh, we looked at was automating screen counts. So we hear analysts and coaches uh, talk all the time about getting traffic in front of the net, and it makes intuitive sense, um, you know, putting players in front of the goalie, obstructing the goalie's view would make it harder to, to save pucks, and Thomas Holmstrom made a career based on that alone. Um, so we automated screen counts to, uh, to, to quantify their impact. Um, so the first thing, uh, you have to define what a screen is. And so for us, we, de we define it as uh, the number of players, offensive and defensive, uh, within with their player tag um, that we had on them being within 18 inches of the triangle created um, between the puck and the two goalposts, which you can see in that, that graphic on the left there. Um, 
And you can see on the, in the chart on the right that um, any kind of traffic in front of the net, whether it's offensive or defensive players, is going to increase shooting percentage. But the um, biggest difference maker is when an offense player, like you can see in the graphic, or um, like what Thomas Holmstrom was doing during his career, uh, was standing you know, right in front of the goalie, um, that, that's, that's increasing shooting percentage all the way up to uh, 11%. So, I found that pretty interesting. And the uh, last thing that we quantified was uh, pre-shot movement. Uh, so some, some goalies are, are good at stopping pucks and the, the scouting report says you have to make the move across the net if you want to score. And the World Cup of Hockey obviously had a lot of these elite goalies. So um, we looked at pre-shot movement and there's probably a lot of ways to define it, but we define it as um, the puck crossing like the, the Royal Road or the, the line drawn between the two goals um, within, one, within one second of the shot being taken. And so uh, I have an example um, of this. Here's the video. You know, I used all So you can see there, uh, Steven Stamkos uh, scored a goal on what we call pre-shot movement. The, the goal was pretty open on the other side because it was a very close um, shot. And, and uh, um, Steven Stamkos led the tournament um, with players with more than 10 shots, um, with shots that had pre-shot movement, 47% of his shots, um, he was on the end of, of pre-shot movement. Uh, so 16% of shot, shots um, throughout the, the tournament had, had pre-shot movement. And in the graphic uh, right there, you can see I broke it down by distance. Um, but on the whole, player shooting percentage with pre-shot movement was 24%, and without any pre-shot movement, it was only 5%. So you can see the impact of, of making the goalie move across the net. And, I mean, especially within you know zero to nine feet, like that last shot was, um, 52%. Um, is a pretty crazy shooting percentage. So now I'm going to turn it back to Jim, and he's going to talk about some of the positional case studies that we looked at based on these shot attributes. All right. So now, now is where we think it gets uh, really interesting. So we took, uh, like I said, we took a lot of readings and we we took uh, problem statements. So in this one, uh, we're really trying to examine sniper skill and. I wanted to pat Rob, or Rob on the back here with his, his statement and really dig into not only speed, but uh, you know, uh, was there a way we could actually isolate and find what players were able to pick their spot? Um, you know, as kids, you know, hockey glorifies this ability to shoot accuracy, right? And so we, we practice on our shooter tutor as we were a kid. You know, and then when you get older, you've got really good, you get to shoot at nice beautiful styrofoam targets, but the same location, and a lot of people watching you. Um, what we realized is that, you know, if we're going to examine accuracy, we've got to figure out a way to isolate when the player is actually trying to shoot accurately, and he's not just throwing it at the net for rebounds. Um, and, and so what we did is we took the hypothesis, we said, all right, building on that heat map you saw, when guys are seven feet open, seven or eight feet open in, in the home plate area, if they're 25% more open than that benchmark, well then they're probably going to use that extra time and space to use their sniper skill. So, what we did is, this is, this is really the story of Stephen Stamkos, right, and players like him. Uh, so tangentially, is there a way to find the next Stephen Stamkos? So what we found, uh, that you can see here, there, I mean, there weren't actually a whole lot of shots throughout the tournament. There were pretty good defenses playing here. Um, you can see a number of shots, a number of patterns very similar to the shooter tutor or the styrofoam targets where, you know, in the bottom left there, as you look at the goal, um, there's clearly a, a precise cluster of shots that are not real accurate because they're missing the net, but they're clearly aiming at the bottom left. One actually scored a goal kind of in that area, the green one. Um, and then there's also some shots top left that are also uh, you know, somewhat precise in that they're trying to trace the crossbar, but they're inaccurate because they didn't hit the goal. And then there's the opposite on the uh, top right where you've got real high precision and high accuracy. That's clearly where they're aiming and they actually hit it. So we think we got a data set to play with that actually does isolate the ability to, to look at uh, you know, a player's skill. 
what was interesting is, you know, if you were to just come into this and you're developing an algorithm, you know, what name do you think would pop out? Stamkos is probably the guy we'd all pick, right? And true enough, he was the guy that had most of these shots. Um, if you really expand this, the guys I think that had more than uh, 10 shots in the tournament and that made this chart were Stamkos, Shifley, and Crosby. So interestingly, Shifley's in pretty elite territory, right? So what we're thinking is for teams and analysts, you know, if you can get this data on the up-and-comers, we think you can actually potentially identify that, that skill, you know, that Brett Hall-like skill to find the opening, be there at just the right time, and actually use your, your sniper skill. Shifley had a pretty good season after the, the World Cup, as it turns out. Um, the next thing we looked at was block shot quality. Um, before I get into this, one member of our team isn't here. Uh, that's Aaron Ward, um, who many of you probably know from his playing days. Um, he's now on staff with us, helping a lot about this. And he said, well, wait a minute, what about defensive? Um, so what we know from, uh, from many writings is that you know, right now, block shots are based on quantity. You know, and the, the popular wisdom is you block a lot of shots, you play for a bad team, you should be in the offensive zone. Um, so what we try to do is say, all right, let's take all these shot attributes and think about block shots from the standpoint of quality instead. So we know, here's, here's Aaron. He was supposed to be here. I thought this was going to be a way to make fun and get a little levity. Um, you know, we know that uh, defensemen oftentimes act like bullies. I think somebody touched on it uh, prior to us. Um, but what, what we want to do is try to introduce quality and try to figure out exactly uh, when these defensemen are doing something heroic. So here is one example we pulled out of uh, the World Cup. I'll play it for you in a minute. But right off the bat, you guys will notice there are things you don't need our stuff for that make this shot particularly dangerous. One, it's on a power play. Um, Sweden's down by a goal in this case, so they're motivated to score. Um, this shot also has, it's a one-timer with pre-shot movement, so it's got some of those characteristics we described. What you don't know without our stuff is where it actually hit on the net, so you can see the plot. We can actually project, because we've got enough data before it got blocked, we know exactly where it would have hit on the net had it not been blocked. We also know it's in that category of angle where it becomes uh, an increased shooting percentage with angle alone. We know that it's a pretty fast shot at 77 miles an hour, and we know the shooter was really open. So you probably had a good opportunity to, I mean, in a one-timer maybe you could argue not, but, um, you know, good opportunity to actually pick a spot. And there was a defensive screen, which we also just showed who's associated with. Calls it out of there, hold it. There's the one-timer for where you were talking about, BC. Bonquist gets out of there. So to some extent, this is a little bit of a, in terms of the way we think about things, it's more of a broadcast, right? This is something we can imagine if you're telling a story about this game, and all of a sudden you know all this stuff, and you can talk about how Sakara just, you know, protected the lead for Team Europe. But it's also something we think may have implications for the way you guys use data to, to think about defensemen. Shots or snapshots, it's yellow. 
um, and then the real hard shots are, are red. Um, if it's a triangular shape, it had an offensive screen associated with it, and if it has a blue halo around it, it means that it had pre-shot movement on it. What you can start to see is, is that, you know, especially with Price, there's a lot of halos. It's a little bit tough. There's a lot of shots here. You can't really quantify it, but he had, I think, 12% more shots that had um, pre-shot movement than the last did, for example. Um, we also see, uh, for Price, there's a lot more uh, of the yellow uh, shots. So there's, you know, more of these sort of middle-of-the-road shots. If it was a fast shot, you notice it tended to be glove side. Almost all the reds on the left side of the net, uh, or right side as we look at it. Um, with the lack, bigger volume of shots. So I should note this is the last two games. Um, so all shots uh, for the last two games. So volume was a part of it. Um, the shots were also more distributed. You see less targeting in particular areas. And then also with that, you see uh, slower shots, a lot more of the green and yellow than compared to price. Perhaps they're emphasizing picking their spot as a smaller goal, you might imagine there's more to, more to look at. So the last thing we did on goalies is we sort of looked at uh, maybe an outcomes type of chart, chart by shot. So some of the things you can see here as you look through this is both goalies stopped fast shots pretty well. The, the 70 mile an hour plus shots didn't get by them. Um, screens were reporting to beating Halak, but less so for Price. Uh, Pre-shot movement was key to beating Price, as you might expect, but not so much for Halak. Um, there was unusual openness associated with nearly all of these goals. Um, and nearly all the goals also had elevated uh, angles to them. So, in summary, um, we hope you now get a, get a picture of what's possible when you track players and pucks at one inch uh, of accuracy. Our system is the most precise, the most fast, and it's the only 3D solution that, that does it at that precision. Um, we've pioneered these systems in nearly every sport. We've had up to 30 years of experience in most all sports. We've had third, fourth, fifth, and sixth contracts. In the NHL, we've been the first, second, and third mover. We hope to be the fourth and final. Um, and we think, you know, as you guys look at this, a lot of this stuff you really can't have, again, if you've got that two foot, one to two foot of, of accuracy. You really need those uh, dividing lines to be much smaller in order to see the difference between players. Um, and if you like this stuff, we want you to get out there and be vocal. Um, one of the things that happened last year for us, uh, I was here uh, for the first time. We were working on the deal for the World Cup. And, Two months after that, we got the deal, so I think maybe it was you guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, help us out again. That's it. Thank you. I don't think it's too bad. Like someone I heard mentioned earlier, computers are cheap. So uh, I, I think it was. I think for this tournament, I want to say it was on the order of ten to twenty minutes. I think. Now, of course, you can imagine whole season NHL data. Yeah, that'd be quite a bit. Um, so probably could process it all at once, but you have to start at first with uh, all the data, and then pick out what you want, and then filter it down. Hi, uh, I have um, um, I have a, a very short comment and a very short question. The short comment is uh, somebody mentioned that they were surprised to see snapshot and wrist chat data looking looking very similar in terms of um, shot speed density profile. Uh, I just thought I'd mention that I, I've done a little bit of work in this, and the two shot categories are indistinguishable in every sense. 
If you look at where slot snapshots and where wrist shots are taken, they're identical. If you look at the scoring percentages for given locations, they're identical. The, uh, my working theory is that um, no one quite knows what the difference is. And, uh, in particular, let's just say there's no evidence in any data I've ever seen that anybody who is categorizing the shots knows or cares about what the difference between them is. And I personally don't think I know. Um, so that's, that, I, I was not surprised in that way. The second thing is, can I please have all of your data? <laughs> is there, is there, well, I, I almost let off with, uh, you know, I can't answer the one question you're all going to ask. Um, I will tell you, uh, from our point of view, I'd love to give it to you. I have um, and, and the NHL was, you know, you know, if they were here, I'd just say, if he says yes, I'll give it to you. So, um, Very good. Let's make a deal. <laughs> Inside the uh, inside the faceoff circles there, but the point still holds that. Can't yeah, when he's saying inside the faceoff circles, I think he's he's mentioning the length away, not so much oh. in between the two circles, you know, uh, width of the ice. Yeah, he's talking about basically the shots are between ten and thirty feet away from that. Yeah, but, but still the same thing can hold. Like it could be a five foot shot or ten foot shot, and the shot angle would be different. And I think that's what I was trying to say at the end, where if you could combine it with the the shot placement charts and also the distance. Uh, with with more data rather than just 16 games, it would, it would start to look differently. I'll add one more thing on the angle. You didn't necessarily ask this, but what's interesting when you look at it by a player level, to your point, you can start to see those guys that just camp in front of the net and they've got that geometrical challenge of the only opening is this really extreme shot. And so when you pair that with what we can do with accuracy, you can start to see those guys that have repeatable skill to hit those sharp angles. Um, and if you catch me on the side, I'll tell you about some, but they're kind of the names you would expect. And we think that's sort of an interesting thing that teams and coaches can <coughs> be interested in. I'll add a final thing real quick. Uh, Michael, I realize I skipped my very first point. Um, I was going to ask you guys a quiz. Uh, so, And while we're making fun of the Maple Leafs, this is the Maple Leafs Zamboni. So how fast do we think? And this requires a little math. You've got to convert this to miles per hour. So how fast do we think Zamboni, Toronto's Zamboni goes? Seven, three, ten. I've heard it actually. Five. It's uh, three miles an hour. We actually had to do that to convince some people that, that we were accurate. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of fun. Let's say you guys are 